In New Orleans, our hotel is half condemned, just half of it. We're in the other half, a room in a wing that's charred, half a wall, half burned with a whiff of mold. The water's been through here, the fire too. Sitting on the edge of the bed with the windows permanently locked. We don't unpack, just take a few items from our bags and place them in another bag before we walk back out of the room. We were late getting there and we're running late for the show. Someone's waiting for us. I toss my toothbrush, toothpaste in with the fripperies so we can clean up in the dressing room. There's a car waiting downstairs. The driver's name is Popcorn. His house is gone. He watched his dog swimming toward him again and again until he couldn't make it. He was swept under right before his eyes. He was up on the roof when his dog Frankie drowned. He asked if we wanted to drive around the neighborhood before the gig. They were running late. We all said, yeah. There are messages spray painted on the front of houses. No one here, two inside. The houses in Necco wave for pastels with broken black boarded up windows, the smell of bleach and gas. Balcony sagging like a sad old showgirl smile, missing teeth. This was my sister's house, said Popcorn. This is where my friend Keith lived. Still can't find his cousin. They're like brothers. Ernestine climbed out here. They saw her in a yellow slip and bike shorts with her babies. Last time they saw her. We're at the city park now where we're playing the voodoo festival. that got rescheduled after the storm. We walk across a soggy field in our city shoes. There's a tent set up in the middle of the field. There's a stage up in front. The tent has a couple of folding tables and metal folding chairs. There's a raft of plastic bottles of water. We brush our teeth, swigging from water bottles, aiming our spit out of the patch of sunlight on the mossy grass behind the tent. There are flags hung from the ceiling of the tent that delineate the space into sections. We rummage through our bags. Someone's got a fancy Bobby Brown compact. Here's another mirror in my kit bag. We share, there's hairspray. I've always got eyeliner, which we know you're not supposed to share, but we do. It's not as though we're sharing needles. We pass them around, rat tail, teasing comb, nail polish, chemical fumes diffusing with the chemical air around us. The smell of gas everywhere, and gasoline, cigarettes, and Clorox. The whir of the generators as loud as the sea. We surprise ourselves by emerging from our bootleg wardrobes with everyone dressed in red and black spontaneously. There's a red and black polyester shirt from the 70s with daisies and a pointy collar. The Richard Pryor shirt, we call it. There's a black tuxedo shirt with red stitching on the ruffles and cuffs. There's a black leather jacket with zippers and a red sequined rose, a red silk blouse, Italian darling with a black vinyl skirt. There are black bolero bell-bottom jeans with hardware on the sides. A cloud of silk scarves which are passed around, tied around bare waists and heads and arms. One used to bandage the wrist of one of us who had been badly bitten on the arm. The stitches were out, but he liked to splint to protect it when he played. Tied with a bow, let us go. Time to put on a show, Miss New Orleans. There's a keg on a crate at the foot of the stairs going up to the stage. A stack of red plastic solo cups. Someone passing a bottle of wine. The show, the show is a nighttime act that's brilliant in the sunshine. We're like the circus in the afternoon. Then there's the second line marching band. The speeches from the mayor let us all in singing amazing grace. Tears in our eyes. Steam rising off the grass around us in the field and the brass horns shining in the sun, brass buttons on the uniforms of the marching band. Later, a woman comes by our tent looking for beer and just to say hello, her hair in a ponytail, cigarette in her hand. She's pale with a sunburn. She tells me she knows the rockabilly dude who booked us here. His ex-wife was a nurse like her. She was a nurse at Mercy Hospital, she said, and she swam through waters with power lines down swam over the power lines in the black waters outside the door of the ER, holding hands, wading and swimming through dark water with black cables and desks, desks floating trash cans and awnings, some of them in their underwear, some in uniforms, some in pajamas, some were going under, babies crying, people praying, curses in the dark, 
There were gunshots too, she said. I can't even tell you what they told us to do, she said, and I gave her a light. I haven't slept since, she said. No one has. There was nothing to eat. We went out in the street and saw what we thought was an animatronic Paul Prudhomme on the sidewalk outside his restaurant, like a figure in It's a Small World After All exhibit, in his shining white apron and took. He waves and smiles at us. He is alive. And he turns his benevolent gaze like Jesus at the crowd, the stragglers, the staggerers, the sleepwalkers, the stumblers, those who try to saunter on bruised feet and aching bones. There were some who walked, heads high, even with a cane, walking sticks and umbrellas. On the balconies, some gas lamps, some candles. The only women are on the balconies, some in wigs, some in stocking wig caps. Down below in the street, we walk in a sea of men. I don't know if I should take my boyfriend's arm or if that would make me look like he just bought me. I don't want to walk alone, but some places it was just single file in the lamplight on the street. I was in candies. I hadn't even brought any sensible shoes. Ridiculous in candies. Steady enough where the street was even, treacherous around the gaping holes, black pits in the pavement, with the smell of an outhouse in the marsh. There was music from windows and trucks, but not the Ernie K. Doe of Bourbon Street. No wild chapatulas. No, now there was the Rolling Stones sounding suburban, miss you, coming from the FEMA workers' bar, and particularly menacingly, the eagles. Cops and soldiers, truckers and lifters, drinking and working and drinking and working, shoulders and backs, hands and helmets. Who has a fleur de lis tattooed on his neck? Who has a shamrock on his hard hat? There were people there we wanted to see, but didn't get it together. Some had been relocated, some had sick kids, some were missing. We were in Spain when the hurricane hit and we had watched it on the news on Sky TV in our hotel. Seems like we were always in Spain when something happened at home. Or what we thought of as home in the world where we moved. Home was of course New York City, but it was other places too. New Orleans belonged to some of us. New Orleans wasn't one of mine, you know, not mine personally. I wasn't attached to it the way some people were. Something that would happen in the world when we were on the road and we'd hear about it and there'd be someone who'd claim it as their catastrophe, their cause, their special place, because they had some roots there, some Proustian connection to the place, the people, a memory, a thread, family or an old girlfriend, maybe a night in jail. It wasn't always about the revolution. I didn't keep up with every story on my own. At night, I wrote to my daughter. She was home in our apartment uptown. That was home. We were talking about Mubarak when the hurricane story came on. Someone had a photograph from the 20s of a couple of Egyptian lesbians in Cairo at a hookah bar. In Spain, meanwhile, the Spanish parliament was about to grant human rights for giant apes. Some of us were fond of southern Spain, where we'd just been, and some preferred the north, the black cattle sculptures looming on the hills, silhouetted against the sunset. Northern Spain, La Coruña, Bilbao, the airport in Bilbao with the giant billboard for the Gulbenkian. That one tiny little bathroom outside the airport where you could wash your face before you got in the van. We got in the van to drive all the way to La Coruña with the efforts of the Galicians, the nationalists, who knows whose language. We weren't sure what to call it. Not sure who was setting up the back line for the show. Not sure who was providing the beers, who published the poetry. And then that time we arrived in Basque country in a village where everyone spoke Muscara. Every sign in Muscara, the graffiti like hieroglyphics on lavender walls with Bougainvillea climbing. The language pictographs to us, indecipherable. Couldn't catch on in the time we had there. We wandered into a dark cafe, geraniums in every window, I straggled in thirsty out of the sun and pointed, just pointed at food. The woman behind the tile bar like a painting, too beautiful to take in in one glance. Her black hair swept under an enormous cloth hat, a wide band around her forehead with a kerchief behind, a sash wrapped around what we used to call a peasant skirt embroidered 
laughing, one perfect tooth missing on the side, gesturing with her strong brown hands behind the bar, staring the men in the face with her black eyes and gold earrings, hitching up her skirt, lacing her boot. She fed us generously and then refused our money. What kind of money did we have? I was 100% not the international currency treasurer. I had trouble keeping track of the bills that looked like paintings to me. And every time we left a country, my boyfriend, now my husband, not good with money either, in spite of his being a Capricorn, would remind me to go through my pockets and my purse and cough up all the coins, which would be useless, useless, he reminded me, wherever we went next, wherever we wound up. Who was talking then about the stampede at the Shia pilgrimage? Who described the procession being trampled, winding up the mountainside on dusty paths, the wailing? Who's got a mnemonic device to remember what's Shia, what's Sunni, what's Ba'ath? The Sunni insurgents, remember, they are not of a sunny disposition. That's how you remember. What's to be learned and what's none of our business? Who knows how it works? Who's in charge anywhere? Who can keep track? Who was talking about the bombs in London? Jane was on her way to work, but got there safely. What about Gerald? Remember when he showed up at that festival, looking like Austin Powers in a mod getup, acting like a completely different person to the one we'd known in the offices and restaurants in London? He was tripping tripping his brains out in Hertfordshire, rolling, as the kids told us later, on Molly. What about cartoons in Muhammad and the Danish newspaper, Danes versus Swedes versus Norwegians? What about that rivalry from the days of the kings? We drew cartoons in Muhammad and Jesus and Buddha on cocktail napkins at the bar. What about the underground hovels of junkies and Christensen? What about having a baby with your boyfriend and getting a free TV from the state? Who was together? Who was other? One of us was a Finnish gypsy who lived in squats in Helsinki as a runaway teenager, used to blowing things up and setting fires. He traveled all over the world, and by the time we left town, he knew how to curse in the local dialect enough to start a riot. He never learned how to say check, please, though, but he knew how to say bumfuck in every language of the world. <laughs> Your mother, your mama, your sister, reading passages from My Name is Red aloud on the bus, marveling at descriptions of the hierarchy of miniaturists, the ancient Ottoman Empire, the mixing of cadmium red, pigment, and scale, how to see the world. It was forbidden to depict a bird's eye view because that would imply the viewer was observing with the eye of God from above. The perspective had to be level, as though you're on the same plane, but tiny, as if at a distance, with details of embroidery and eyebrow, somehow perceptible. The ideal is to be equal and present, paying attention, not too broke to pay attention. Picturing Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia, standing on top of the moving train. What about when your favorite movie is Lawrence and there's not one single woman in it? What about when you don't even think about going mad? You just accept that there is madness. You go out and make a show, make something beautiful, ephemeral. We didn't film everything, anything really. I wrote in my notebook, always crossing the desert in a caravan with a dying hermaphrodite in a palanquin. And then that summer on Fire Island at Danny's little house called Rabbit Hill. We were so broke, we took a job ghostwriting a book about the Osbournes, popular on TV at the time. Though I'd never seen the show until we were hired to write a couple of books about Kelly and Sharon. At Rabbit Hill, we were enchanted. Faded down slipcover on the slept-in couch. Ralph Lauren tartan tattered pillows. Victorian mirrors cloudy and copper. Shelves of fragile, dried-out carapace of paperbacks. Agatha Christie, Tom of Finland, Trollope, and of course, Symposium, Platonic. There was a television in the living room where we watched old episodes of the Osbournes on video. They played on a loop while we took notes about Kelly's lipstick, Ozzy's kitchen, and just made up the rest. We were on deadline. In the other room, Satyricon plays on a loop all day and night with the dying hermaphrodite 
carried on a palanquin, often getting stuck on this scene endlessly through the desert. My daughter was out there with me then at Rabbit Hill and quite aware that children were not entirely welcome this part of the island, not anywhere near the Belvedere, not anywhere near the Belvedere. Summarily, she was put to work detangling the morning glories which needed to be done or mixing the perfect vodka grapefruit, a lesson on how to make her little bed properly, how to devein shrimp for the shrimp cocktail being served to the famed Egyptologist who often came over for drinks and talked about his paintings at sunset in the kitchen, leaves against the window like a hand to a face, a couple of bleach blonde tattooed lost boys from the bar, the arc of their lower backs, the arrow leading down their flat bellies, a line of down into their shorts, and the old drag queen who was not speaking to them. Someone was doing coke on the dresser, trying to manage the dementia brought on by interferon, which they used to treat hep C. Later, we walked single file in the dark under a sliver of moon along the splintered boardwalk that had been constructed years ago through the woods so that Eleanor Roosevelt could travel secretly more swiftly undercover to her lover in another bungalow further down the beach. Eleanor Roosevelt, who was said to have done so much for women, but not for fallen women, as it turns out, not for the women who sold their beauty or rented it out, at least in the streets. Was that the deer we heard running in the woods along the path? No, it was men, their bare backs shining in the moonlight through the leaves. Some people hated the deer, considered them invasive, overgrown rodents, a pestilence wandering into the yard like dope fiends, wanting something. Deer in the headlights describes a natural state before your game face is on each day, before you can say, let's dance, or showtime in your best Bob Fosse voice, before the first cup of coffee that takes you over the Maginot line between dreams and what we call real life. Some of us love the deer and think of Bambi, those of us who have Bambi in our hearts unable to bear the thought of Bambi's mother, our first early childhood collective loss before we lost JFK that day at school and walking home, all the mothers were crying. We were so sure Sinead had killed herself and some of us, we thought we understood. That's what it is. All the mothers are crying and we're walking each other home. Thanks.